Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Analyst Angle, Wireless in the Enterprise, a deeper reach, a more active role for venue owners with Monica Pellini of Senza Philly. Just some quick um, housekeeping for everybody. The webinar slides will be available after the webinar. Um, please do ask any questions. We will be sure to answer them during the webinar or after the webinar. Um, with that, um, Please do begin, Monica Pellini. Ben, thanks a lot uh, for uh, uh, your introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and happy Halloween to all of you guys. And uh, thanks for calling in. Um, today, we are gonna talk about uh, uh, the wireless in, wireless in the enterprise. And uh, uh, specifically, what we're gonna talk about is the evolution of the role of, uh, of the enterprise uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, the years and uh, uh, see what, what's happening in the future. And this is a, um, a, a, a preview of a report that is coming out on uh, uh, November 13. So, um, this is uh, um, so the report will be available to all of you. Um, you will receive a copy. Uh, it's uh, it's free to download, and um, uh, it, it will it will contain an analyst report, as uh, uh, all the other reports uh, uh, that we are doing in collaboration between uh, uh, Sensafili and RCR Wireless, and uh, there will be interviews with the sponsors, uh, uh, in-depth interviews. Um, now, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, uh, the report. Uh, and then I will give you a sense of what it, the interviews are about because the interviews are the most interesting part of the report. Uh, that's the secret. And uh, today we uh, also have two guests. We have Jim Allison, the manager of planning at CCJPA, the Capital Corridor. Um, it's a, 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 he will tell us more, but uh, it's a, a train operator in, in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, uh, Marin Martinovich, the vice president of marketing and sprint business, uh, uh, who is working uh, with, with the enterprise. And then we will have Q&A. So you can get started and write uh, the the questions and then uh, we will go through them. Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, hold on here. Okay, so um, the, the, the reason why I decided to write this report on the enterprise uh, uh, and not on the enterprise specifically and not on say small cells intensification or in, uh, in building wireless it is because i think that there is something much deeper than simply having infrastructure in the enterprise uh in, in the sense that it's, it's not just uh, uh well because there is already a lot of uh wi-fi there is a lot of there is a gas there's a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure already in there, but what I really want to talk about is the is the role that the enterprise has in the overall ecosystem. Uh, so yes, they will have more infrastructure, but the, the issues that but but the, the different the changes that they will have more services. They will have a, a bigger role in setting the, the, the in deciding what they need and setting their requirements and making sure they're met. And that's very interesting because that changes the relationship with, uh, among players and I think it will move forward our ability to um, finally get into the enterprise, provide the coverage they need. And what the, the reason why this is coming up, up together now is because the enterprise realizes they have the, they have the needs. IoT is propping them up. Uh, and the, the evolution of the network is such that it's really conducive to uh, to this to this change, and I will get into all of these uh, aspects later. And then there is the technology and regulatory um, changes that enable again th this change. And then there are, in the, at the same time, new business models that are becoming more compelling. So the, the the confluence of all these elements make it possible finally for the enterprise to get a bigger role, to get a better service. And, uh, um, and, and that, that I think will, will be beneficial to everybody involved because there is more, um, uh, more activity. Um, so um, now, first of all, let me say what counts as enterprise. Um, so um, uh, it's actually, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very broad concept. Um, the, by enterprise, I mean, uh, both the obvious one, the office building, campuses, factories, warehouses, but also outdoor business locations like mining fields, 
um, but also public or semi-public venues, colleges, hospitals, airports, stadiums, malls. So basically everything that, uh, in every case where there is an entity that controls a venue. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it will become clear why um, I'm, I'm looking at that. And uh, as I said before, this change doesn't stop within the enterprise. It's not just putting a few small cells or a DAS or a Wi-Fi network, uh, but it just, it's just going to change the way we think and use spectrum. We uh, have uh, we, and we uh, we roll out networks, and 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 basically, it's a bigger role for the real estate uh, uh, rights uh, for for the, for the real estate owners to to use that their rights. Um, okay, so let me quickly talk about a little bit of the evolution of wireless in the enterprise, and um, uh, I think that 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 is uh, that is uh, important uh, to put it in perspective. Uh, even though what I'm saying is not is not going to be uh, really an entirely new to all of you. So when when cellular arrived in uh, um, uh, well not just in the enterprise, when, when cellular uh, appeared, um, the enterprise was mostly dominated by wireline. And oftentimes, the 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 the, the, the IT hat was basically com was made off of uh, individual um, uh, machines that were not connected to each other somewhere, somewhere not. And cellular was something that was outside. Uh, you might have indoor coverage, but the network was completely owned by. I mean, it was separate from uh, the the what was happening inside the enterprise and outside. Then, what with Wi-Fi arrives, wireless appears into the enterprise. And initially it was a very minor sort of uh, uh, the, the exception at, at the edge, you know, so, somebody would have Wi-Fi. And, <clears throat> but mostly it was still uh, wireline. And, and the cellular was still outside the enterprise on, in its own, separate. Um, what we have today, the two have started to merge. So there is a, a Wi-Fi both on the outside, so mobile operators would have some Wi-Fi or they use Wi-Fi for offload, and the enterprise has a massive Wi-Fi, massive Wi-Fi networks that basically provide mo most, uh, most of the connectivity, while it's pretty much disappearing or disappeared in terms of the access. Uh, we all use wireless for our um, uh, connectivity. And then you'd have a, a mobile that is, is coming into the enterprise through DAS and small cells, um, mostly in big venues. Uh, and so what you're seeing is that the two are started to get together and not only it's humans being connected, but some, uh, uh, some other devices, sensors or any machine to machine, IOT, you name it. Um, what we're seeing moving forward is the two networks, the outside and in the, 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 the wide area network and the enterprise network uh, are going to be, are going to have multiple air interfaces, multiple technologies. Those technologies will be increasingly integrated and there will be many more uh, connecti connectivity to, um, to devices that are not humans. And I'm going to talk about this, uh, but the, clearly the enterprise will retain some control and the operators will retain some control, but that control is going to be shared. So everybody will get what they need from it, but at the same time, it's important for those networks to become much more um, integrated in order to serve all the needs that everybody has. So um, here, um, so what that first of all what 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 about what are the priorities in all this? Why are we moving from in, in to this type of uh, next uh, uh, stage and so these are these are the priorities from the enterprise so from one end there is a need there is the need to address some requirements and at the same time there is a need to find the right balance and the two have to go together to make sure that the whole the, 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 the whole system is, is working and we can progress to this kind of network. So from the, from the enterprise point of view, the basic needs are clearly coverage, capacity density. And so it's not just, it's not just capacity, it's not just megabits per second, it's megabits per second per square foot or whatever your unity is. So it's important to have a, a capacity in a, in a dense uh, uh, environment. Uh, I support be able to support IoT applications, have pervasive connectivity that uh, uh, 
com combines both humans and uh, uh, other, other devices. Um, an intelligent allocation of resources and application-based traffic management because once you have a network that has to do multiple things, so it's not just providing basic connectivity for people to check their email, which was at the, uh, the beginning or to get onto uh, into the internet, but you have video, you have voice, you have data, you have IoT, you have uh, sec uh, security, safety, uh, you have uh, applications that are mission critical. It's important that the network is smart enough to accommodate all these type, types of traffic uh, depending on what's, what's going on at any given time. Um, and then the ability to have content that it's local uh, and doesn't go away because a lot of the process in the early applications in the enterprise remain local, use local content, but also be able to uh, have those applications and the uh, connectivity to be ubiquitous. And this is why you, you need to have the link to the wide area networks. And then all of this, obviously some a good security um, framework. Uh, how to do that, however, and so there is a question, there is a need to balance the need between private networks, a network that the uh, enterprise might own or manage, but over which it has control, and the public networks, so that it would be the, the, the wide area network or the, the infrastructure that an operator has in the enterprise. Um, also, there is a question of the, 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 the balance between what, is, what content is local and what content is better suited to be in the cloud. That's an important distinction. Um, what is owned um, by the enterprise and what's being hosted. So the enterprise, so for instance, the Wi-Fi networks typically are owned by the enterprise managed and uh, they take care of them, but then um, a DAS network might be um, own, owned by the enterprise, but managed by, um, um, by the operator. But then there could be other services that are hosted and uh, um, uh, by, by a neutral host. So there is a, there is a, there is a mix here. Um, and then what is controlled and what is monitored uh, by the enterprise and by extension by uh, other parties like uh, mobile operators. So uh, there are some, some, uh, some applications some services that the enterprise might want to control and might want to be able to uh, support through their own private networks, Wi-Fi networks, and public networks, um, uh, or some networks that are owned by all mobile operators. And for some other, op um, for some other applications, uh, they might be okay to have somebody else come in and um, operate those services as long as they're able to monitor them. Where is where are all the where, where are all the boundaries? That that is something that it's really being um, sort of crucial to the evolution, but still there is no uh, clear answer. There is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a lot of adjustment that needs to be done. And then for different, uh, for different enterprises, the answer might be different. Um, now in, in the, the whole, this whole uh, change is in line and needs to be in line with industry trends. And, uh, um, uh, and and it's, so it's just a, it's just a good time for everything to come together, and this is a time where operators clearly want to have um, uh, to monetize their networks, and they cannot just monetize by asking subscribers to pay more. So just having a higher ARPU is is is, is a very difficult way to go. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the enterprise is an opportunity for growth and monetization in terms of the ability to offer new services to the enterprise. And <clears throat> so on one hand, the enterprise might be willing to own more of the infrastructure, but it's also more willing to uh, buy services because they are absolutely crucial to their operations. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, there is an increase in densification and in building wireless because most of the usage comes from indoors. And so finally, everybody realized that that's the best. So the, since all the usage is coming from indoors, might as well put more of the infrastructure indoors because it's a more uh, efficient way of uh, uh, protecting macro capacity and also to, to provide cost-effective capacity. Um, now, at this, 
in addition to that, there is an impo increased importance of venue ownership because if you move to indoors, obviously you need to go and you need to work with the venue owner. So they already, they, they are getting a bigger role. Um, but also there are initially like CBRS in the U US where um, the FCC is uh, uh, enabling uh, spectrum sharing in the 3.5 gigahertz band so that um, it, it's possible to use uh, to use that that band in at the same time as uh, uh, military and other users. Um, now, what with CBRS, it's possible to use uh, the uh, the, the three point five band in in private networks and in public networks and the, uh, the two together. But um, the, in private networks, uh, entities can use it. Um, in, in within their own location. So that's again, it's another uh, push for um, uh, the uh, role of venue owners. The other thing is that this is something that I've been talking about in previous reports is the move from atomic networks to pervasive networks. And I don't want to go and spend too much time on this, but basically the networks are becoming much more, uh, much less tied to um, the network infrastructure and much, the, the networks are being designed for the subscribers rather than from a network perspective. At the beginning, it was so it was just such a miracle to have a, a you know a, a cellular network working to have coverage capacity. So it was mostly it was the, deployed from a network point of view. Uh, now uh, that we, we mastered that, there is much more of a uh, the, the challenge is to make sure that subscribers have the capacity, uh, coverage, and latency they need wherever they are. So it's a very different approach. And as you do that, you move more to um, um, a virtual, a virtualized infrastructure, a, a infrastructure where um, there is more indoor coverage, less telecom assets, new ownership models, and, and uh, the ability to manage based on, on traffic uh, type and application. And, and all of this makes it makes the network much more diverse. And uh, uh, so there is much more of a need to work with the venue owners because that, that becomes so, so crucial. Um, now, in terms of enablers, in terms of technology and uh, regulatory, I already talked about the CBRS. Um, that that's a that's a big enabler. Uh, but let let's go through the other ones as well. Um, now Wi-Fi. Now you might be surprised that I put Wi-Fi here as the first one before even 5G. Um, you know clearly Wi-Fi. When we talk about wireless, uh, Wi-Fi it takes most of the traffic. Most of the the traffic to mobile devices goes through Wi-Fi. Um, so Wi-Fi is not going to go away, and in fact, it's evolving uh, to to become, uh, you know, part of a 5G family of uh, uh, technologies. And it's it's going to be still present, but what is changing is that Wi-Fi is going to be more and more integrated with cellular. And the advantage of that is that we can use uh, both the, the advantages of both technologies, leverage them in a more specific way. So depending on what you're trying to do, you'll be using one or the other. So it's not a question of which one you should use or which one is, you know, who's the winner. The question is what's the best way to get them to work together. So in that, that respect, Wi-Fi will continue to be a, a, a huge, uh, has a, have a huge importance in the enterprise. Uh, but then again, uh, obviously, 5G is coming along, and before 5G, we'll have uh, LTE, LTE advanced, and uh, so there, there is clearly, and there is a lot of uh, um, innovation in there. Um, so 5G is a technology that is not just, is, is not just, or primarily, I think, a new air interface is the ability to combine multiple interfaces, and. And, uh, and, and, com and integrated with Wi-Fi. So in that respect, it works very well with the enterprise where you have different coexisting needs that need different technologies. Um, IoT is clearly a game changer in the sense that uh, um, we need to have, uh, um, well, the, the enterprise has this huge potential need, or well, IoT is a potential opportunity to use wireless to, um, to, uh, its advantage, to, 
to facilitate a lot of the processes. And it's already a lot of, there's a lot of IoT, uh, IoT with, with Wi-Fi today. So, um, so this is going to push wireless further in the enterprise, deeper down. To, their up, the, to the core operation. So it's not just the connectivity that sits on top, it's just going to become uh, completely in, in integral. CBRS already talked about, um, then there is an increased interest for unlicensed uh, use, uh, 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 things like LAA, multifier. Um, so there is the increased use interest in, both from the enterprise and from the operators to use unlicensed bands in the enterprise. And the clear is intensification, small cells in, in building wireless, which I mentioned before. So there are all elements that make it natural for the, for the enterprise to take a, a bigger role. Now, here uh, we, we look at the, there are different models, for instance, with CBRS. Uh, once you have a situation where the, the, the venue owners have more control, there are different, uh, different uh, models. And that might work. So you have, might have private networks where the uh, enterprise has the, owns the um, uh, infrastructure, the operator might own it, or there might be a, a neutral host. And it could be any combination of them. Um, now, what, what is interesting about this, and the reason why this is important, is because uh, when you get to, to um, middle size uh, um, uh, enterprises, uh, there is an uh, it's very difficult for the operators to go and, uh, you know, address all of them. So it's important that uh, uh, there are different uh, ownership models in order to address all the enterprise uh, um, um, uh, needs. Um, and, and so this is uh, um, in terms of, uh, the, the, you know, the business models here um, for the enterprise uh, I think that what we're going to see is uh, it's, uh, the need to, for different models to coexist and to mix. So if you look at today, there is uh, the enterprise-owned, Wi-Fi is typically enter enterprise-owned, and you have a DAS that usually have a, um, a neutral host model, and then you have small cells or other in-building wireless that is uh, owned by the operator. And as we move forward, we're going to see... Um, a much richer type of, of an environment where we would have still have some enterprise owned, some operator owned, uh, especially in, in the, in the, in the big, uh, in the big uh, venue. So in a stadium or um, uh, stadium airport, big, big malls, or, you know, you might have the operator have their own infrastructure. Um, but especially as you go to the middle way, a middle price, um, you will see more, um, a, a bigger variety of business models. So you will still have DAS, but you will also have private networks that combine IoT, uh, hybrid models where you might have a private network that also hosts uh, uh, public access. Uh, and then you might have edge computing infrastructure that will uh, also uh, enable a, a, a whole set of local services. And those could be either uh, be based on by uh, owned or operated by a neutral host or be offered as a service, as a uh, infrastructure, of it, sort of as, as a service uh, um, uh, basis. And, and none of that is, is exclusive. So you can have any combination of them. And I think that that's, uh, uh, that's important. What that, what that allows us to do is to have more of a, shared ownership and control depending on what needs to be done, uh, better cost savings uh, and uh, uh, ROI and a flexibility that really is going to be necessary to, uh, to uh, you know, attract, to, to address all the, the, the market, the, the market uh, um, requirements of the enterprise because right now today the enterprise is a big unserved market. Anyway, uh, oh, uh, interviews. Let me go quickly through the interviews here. Um, so uh, in, in the report, we have interviews with the sponsors. Uh, so we have, um, uh, um, among the interviews, we have uh, uh, Comscope. Um, and uh, we talked with, uh, um, uh, with Comscope about uh, what is the need for the, for the enterprise. Um, and how wireless is becoming such an 
in, intrinsic and the important part of the um, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, the operational part of in the enterprise. Um, then we talked to uh, Intel with the uh, Ashakari and Intel, and we talked about uh, uh, 5G IoT, how that is changing, and also um, uh, how our IoT is also uh, important in all, in all this, and both using license and unlicensed spectrum. Uh, an activity, uh, this, this is also quite interesting in talking about a different approach. And this, this is really something that is coming up in, in a lot of the, you know, the interviews. It's not just one way to go. It's there different, different approaches and, uh, um, uh, to in building wireless. And uh, Nextivity is, uh, provides a very interesting uh, alternative to um, uh, you know, traditional gas. And small cells. Uh, Ken uh, Sanfield at Solid uh, uh, talked about uh, the middle price uh, and how do we address the need for coverage in uh, uh, enterprises that uh, um, are not the big ones, the ones that get a lot of attention, but they nevertheless account for most of the buildings and square footage in both in the US and other countries. Um, and then we have two interviews uh, with the uh, um, uh, service providers and uh, since we're, we're, we will be they will be here I'm not gonna say much about them because we're gonna talk to Jim Allison right now and then uh, with uh, um, uh, we had the interview with uh, Jan Genmacher and uh, Mario Markovich is going to be here with us today anyway well thank you so much and I think that we can uh, get started and talk about uh, talk to Jim Allison at the uh, CCJPA um, thanks for being for, with us today. Let me do a little Halloween. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, well, um, Jim, thanks for being with us today. And, you know, we've been working for a long time together. So can, can you tell us what is that you guys are doing at um, um, CCJPA when it's not Halloween and go around with it? Yeah, when I don't have a knife in my head. Um, <laughs> Well, what we've been doing uh, since early on in 2003, right about when Wi-Fi came along, um, people on our trains, who many of them work in Silicon Valley, uh, they'll take the train because they live some distance away. They uh, wanted Wi-Fi on the trains so they could be productive and you know get work done and those kind of things. So um, those were very early days. We were testing business models uh, and mostly testing technology, which really wasn't at that time up to snuff. Uh, so that was late 2003, then all the way through, really until we got to 4G, LTE. Um, that's when everything aligned in terms of the capacity. And what we have now, and what many train operators have, is a backhaul done via aggregated cellular service from the major providers. And that's repurposed on the train to provide a Wi-Fi connection um, to those on the train. It's, it's uh, many times done for free. Ours is free. And then the um, folks on the train can be productive on the way to work. We, we don't really let them watch videos because that would uh, hurt the bandwidth. But, uh, that's the basics of what we have. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we've been working with Amtrak on that for quite some time. Yeah, and it, it's always, uh, um, you know, it's almost sort of uh, ironic that, you know, you use cellular for, for the backhaul. And because that's usually the, the other way around, you know, you just want to be using something, I mean, the seller for the, for the access. Uh, so how, how is it, uh, uh, how is this going to change with 5G and, uh, uh, you know, with the increase in capacity? Is that going to change things dramatically or what, what's, what's going to be the impact? I'm thinking it won't change it too dramatically. I mean, the spirit of things is that there's little modems that slip into the uh, central computing device that's uh, then it's linked all throughout the car so as a new modem comes along for 5g of course they have to test it to integrate it but um, they'd be able to put those in and then we can do a series of replacements according to the kind of uh, the, the, the mix of cellular towers and composition along the route and that's what we did we with a 3g or three and a half g to 4g we had a mixture and now we're really all 4g so we'll be able to swap out and um, you know, adapt, I would think. Um, you know, some of our 
hardware is getting a little long in the tooth right now, but uh, even as we upgrade that, the main concept is just replace modems as you go along, as long as they're certified to work in the system. And where it will, may change mostly is what we do to manage the service presented to the customer. We, in theory, will be able to allow people to actually stream some video. We'll change the, some of the user caps and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's, a big, that's a big challenge because when you get on a train, you see that everybody's pretty much connected. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's a hugely popular service. Yes, it's very popular. Um, we have a lot of bandwidth terabytes used on a, a weekly basis and just keeping up with that demand and trying to manage the user experience um, is very crucial. Uh, we've seen our business model was to provide it for free and then that would lead to uh, an uptake in the ticket sales because this is a mode of transportation <clears throat> that people really value and they value their time in doing that work. Yeah, and that's interesting because the monetization doesn't come from uh, charging for the service, but for uh, providing, uh, I mean, for basically motivating people to use more of the, uh, the, tra the train more often. Yeah. That's what we've, um, we, that was a hard one to study. So we worked with uh, some research at University of California, Davis, and this was a pretty big landmark test in the um, trains and Wi-Fi world to determine did that business model actually work. And we had about a 2.7% increase in trips that were actually taken for that. And the business model predictions, you know, in terms of ROI was going to be about 1.5% as, as you remember working with you. So we got a good return on that investment in terms of um, loyalty. And now if we were to imagine taking it away, there would probably be riots. And that may be why I have that knife. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have it you have it psychologically every time you go to work you need to make sure everything works and yeah. um now um you know so so you talk about having you know passengers using video but what about you guys i mean the, the train operator using that network it's a it's a huge asset for for your own operations oh it absolutely is we're um we're doing a number of initiatives right now one of the hardest ones uh is right now putting on this application called Onboard Information Systems, and that's called OBIS, and it's a video and audio automated announcements, kind of geofenced as we go along the route, and then that will play sort of canned content, rotate it through much like a player piano, it will play a certain sequence of screens and do a certain sequence of announcements, and then it hits another geofence and repeats that. So that's all cache content, but it's also connected. It will be connected real time to the operation center so they can put out real time announcements and communicate to people in the train, also alleviating the, cut, the conductors to focus more on safety or indoor customer service. So that's a big step, but they're just, just the fact of being connected is, is a game changer because we can start monitoring systems. We can reduce costs and how we maintain things. Uh, it, the list doesn't, really end until we find out um, how that would get into the sort of the culture. But that's the hardest part is the culture part. What's so hard about the culture? Well, the hardest part about the culture is that train operators are steeped in how they were doing things, you know, at least 10 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. So it's taking a long time for the culture to wake up to the opportunities, having real time data, and changing the practices of how you would do things. And the, just the practice of making, going to the microphone to make an announcement about arriving at a station, pretty soon that won't have to happen anymore. Um, the practice of maintaining a piece of hardware on the train according to a schedule won't have to happen anymore because you can make, watch it in real time and then you can reduce your costs and you can have better equipment utilization. So those are just two of the bigger aspects of things um, and so the, the whole culture part of it is kind of a people are starting to see that people really like the Wi-Fi and then if you kind of knock on their heads you say hey you have a network here you can connect all sorts of other things and some of the people are getting it some of them aren't it's just sort of how how aware people are of what a network can do and what the data can do traveling over that network 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's uh, sometimes the, the hardest part. It's not the technology, it's the people that have to use it. And so that also that brings another issue that is, um, well, another important topic in, in the service you offer, you have to work with mobile operators. How is that relation, how, how is it working right now and how do you think it's going to evolve with time? Well, right now it's a relatively quiet relationship because we just get modems and or Amtrak gets the modems, we work with Amtrak on that and they put them in. So the sales department sell, puts those out, they're purchased and they're purposed and placed in the train. Um, those modems may or may not have different uh, limitations on them in terms of bandwidth or, or unlimited data. Um, so that's always an important consideration and there's usually some uh, sort of government, uh, you know, uh, government rate or something like that, some package plan that we're able to use. So that's about the extent of the relationship right now. What I would see moving ahead though would be, um, and something that hasn't happened yet would be, for instance, putting small cells in the train to optimize voice and data traffic for those who aren't even on the network. And uh, that is some, that's an opportunity sitting out there to provide a better quality handoffs and things like that. So um, I would see that that might come along, but it's not no, by no means a guarantee. It's just sort of how into this particular enterprise are mobile operators is the question. And it really depends on sort of size, uh, like a New York subway or a BART out here is definitely engaged with mobile operators because of they share the same customers. Our service isn't as engaged at that level, um, but it doesn't mean it couldn't change. So what is, what is the, from your point of view, the, the advantage, you know, the value proposition that you'd offer to a mobile operator in terms of, you know, you have this real estate, what's, what's the pitch to the operator? What's, what's good for them? Why is it good to them? Well, there's a number of opportunities. In our case, uh, we operate on Union Pacific right away. So we don't have a physical asset, but many transit operators do. The assets that we have are the train equipment and the kind of a captive audience. And so we would try to leverage those assets to bring some value to the mobile operators in the way I was talking about with small sales. In the case where you own your right away, it's a one-stop shop for putting, um, putting out equipment. And you think of New York City with Transit Wireless um, or BWI, they're, they're in Toronto and, and New York City and other, and other places. They're actually utilizing as a kind of a neutral host model the assets of the transit operator. Um, another great example was in Moscow subway. Um, this uh, company, Maxim, got access to the subway, which is deep, deep underground, so the mobile operators can't get in there. And um, they've installed a system that is uh, making it worse. People go down and ride the subway to download movies, and they go back up and watch their movies. I mean, it's, it's fast and there's different models and lots of data coming there. And in fact, who's coming there are the mobile operators are now asking back in to the Maxim system. So Maxim won out by getting in early on that asset. Um, so, but any of the uh, major subway operators or land holders, um, and there's many around the US, have those assets. And um, it's a one-stop shop, whether it's for infrastructure or for reaching the customer. Okay, Jim, thank you so much, and we'll get you back with a Q&A, but let me now move to uh, Mary Martinovic, who is the v VP of Marketing at Sprint Business. And uh, do we have you? Mary, are you there? I am here. Hi. Okay, excellent. Okay, very good. So uh, I see you. Well, thanks for being with us today. Um, can you tell us a bit about what you do and what, what is that you're doing at, uh, uh, what is it Sprint Business is doing in, in this area? Sure, great. Well, first of all, good day. Uh, I don't have, unlike Jim, a Halloween prop uh, with me, and so I'm going to be the boring guy. Um, I appreciate the time and the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure uh, this morning to be on a panel uh, and be discussing uh, some top of mind topics for most of the audience. Um, really, my role as a vice president of marketing here at Sprint Business is really to um, bring the awareness uh, in the marketplace um, around many, many solutions, and we'll get into that um, here shortly, and how they really profoundly impact uh, the, the businesses of our customers. But really importantly, how do we go and help our customers serve their customers better, more profitably, and more securely? And trying to really evolve from being a connectivity player, which is really, really important, as Jim and, and you 
have spent a lot of time about being connected from a mobile perspective, really extending that beyond this simple connectivity into managed services and then ultimately into applications, especially as we evolve into the next chapter of growth um, for mobile operators and not just for us, but really for um, all technology um, companies as we get into the IoT space and we get this immense um, explosion of connected devices uh, that are not just going to be connected, they're going to be sensors and do a lot more than just having connectivity. They're going to be gatherers of data uh, that are going to be driving uh, business decisions uh, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you touched on many different issues. So yeah. let's go for, to the first one. So you said you want to move from connectivity to services. What do you mean by that? What, what does that entail? Well, so today a lot of the mobile operators are really providing a connectivity, whether that be to a mobile device, to a machine to machine device. And what we're trying to do is really create an ecosystem, um, especially anticipating the trillions of IoT devices that will become connected. Um, and, 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 and those things really don't just require connectivity, they require a full management, uh, including all the way up into the application development, whether that be with a customer or with a partner so that that connection is actually meaningful. Um, so as an example, um, a company that might be manufacturing refrigerators, having a sensor today, we're starting to see connected refrigerators and having that connectivity and sensor really in the entire ecosystem, entire supply chain distribution from the time that um, refrigerator is built on the manufacturing line until it's being tracked and shipped to whatever continent it's going to be sold being in a store, being tracked when it's actually being sold and then ultimately delivered to a customer who is going to use it, who will need that device to be connected and for that sensor to collect data uh, and provide decisions, whether that be for that end user as well as the manufacturer of the refrigerator. So it's being yeah. part of the entire value chain as opposed to just being on the front end and just simply providing the connectivity. And so how is that changing the relationship you have, you know, with the gym, we're talking about the cultural issue and issues and here there's a lot of just, it's not just the technology. How do you structure the relationship with the enterprises? And oftentimes it's not a big enterprise. It might be a relatively smaller enterprise. How is that? How do you see that changing through time? Well, I think it's going to change it in a meaningful way. Again, I think as you evolve from just simply supplying connectivity to really uh, understanding the customer needs or how our customer wants to really um, um, in, embrace or how do they want to provide the customer experience to the customers that they serve and working with them hand in hand to be able to deliver that um, experience. I mean, a couple of examples just because we talked about public transit. And so we recently sprint uh, business within uh, this last year has made a significant investment with the New York transit system where we've gone to a massive update just so all of the things that um, Jim mentioned, just the thirst for data and connectivity and, and being able to be productive uh, while you're in transit, uh, it was a massive project where we've enabled um, 5G and ability for that connection to be meaningful with the customer, all the way to working here locally in Kansas City with the city of Kansas City uh, and trying to make our city a lot uh, more robust and smarter, uh, starting with Again, with the connectivity, providing connectivity to the citizens, to the tourists, uh, giving them access to all of the attractions here in Kansas City. Doing that, by the way, free of charge. Uh, we have a new investment in a, uh, a streetcar uh, that is connecting our city that is just growing exponentially. Um, and we are at the forefront of that, but then also working with the city to make the city a lot more intelligent. So whether that be the lighting systems that they use, the sensors in the rail so that people don't park in front of a streetcar um, or the parking meters, all of those things, uh, and just enabling better services as well as safety and security of the citizens in Kansas City. Yeah, and that's that's a huge uh, number of applications. And but one thing that it's in common in all this, and uh, uh, you know, sort of like more private enterprises, is the need to provide also security. Uh, yes. So, how do you address that? Sure, that's. I mean, that's that's foundational to everything that we do. Uh, I think where security becomes um, crucial for us, uh, and part of the reason why we have a really compelling story to tell is Sprint uh, today is owned by SoftBank uh, as our parent company. Uh, for those that may not be familiar, um, SoftBank has invested over $100 billion into a vision fund 
that has many, many different companies that are going to be part of an ecosystem uh, that is really going to um, exponentially get this growth um, beyond the mobile devices, um, including security. And so ARM is a chip maker that is in 90 plus percent of all of the smart devices today. Those same chipsets are going to be um, across all of the other devices that I'm going to connect, whether it be a refrigerator, whether that be um, you know, a, a random thing today that isn't even connected. Um, and ARM today has the outmost um, security protocol. Uh, and for us, that is part of the, the vision fund and part of the opportunity or the ecosystem that we have access uh, and ability to, to really push security. Yeah. Now, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the ownership. So traditionally, mobile operators would own all the infrastructure. That would be, that's it, simple. And now you start seeing a lot more variety. It started with neutral hosts in the, for gas. And uh, uh, now with, uh, you know, the, the, there, is, uh, there is more of a interest from the enterprise to actually pay for the infrastructure. But on the other hand, the, also, the, the enterprise does not want to put a lot of CapEx investment and they want to rather pay on an OpEx basis, so as a service. Mm-hmm. What, what's, your, what's your view? What, what's, your, what's your take on this? So, um, so I think that's been a challenge uh, for some time in the marketplace. Uh, we sprint business two years ago, really sort of positioned um, our position in the market as a service provider. Uh, and so we started with mobility as a service uh, where we actually um, really allow enterprise customers and really business customers of all sizes to take advantage of OPEX friendly environment. We know a technology cycle is shorter and shorter. It's also getting more and more expensive if you're watching the news, whether it be the new iPhone, things are just getting more expensive and they change over almost every year, every two years. And so um, for us, uh, ability to have a scale and then to pass on uh, that operating model onto our customers is really important because it gives them value and not having to be stuck with a technology that may get dated really, really quickly or maybe not the right technology. And so we take the ownership of that as well as the integration and the deployment of the technology to their end users and manage it on their behalf. And so where we see ourselves going is expanding that beyond just uh, mobile devices, which is what's in our portfolio today, but doing it uh, from an IP uh, and wireline network and selling our network as a service uh, per seat so that you can come in and you can just buy a seat. It's very predictable. It's simple. Uh, it doesn't change. You can scale up or down and then doing the same sort of concept for IoT. And does, does that allow you to serve better the middle price? So the, the, the part of the, the enterprise that has been the most difficult one to, to address. Sure. Absolutely. It, it always starts with, I think, that uh, mid-sized company, which was our, our speed, sweet spot a couple of years ago, just because they may not have the expertise, they may not have the dedicated staff uh, to really do that. And so they're looking for a partner that can help them take that challenge uh, on their behalf. But as, as this has been in market and as we've engaged really with larger enterprise customers, there's certainly a demand and interest for um, as a service um, concept because today they do that with software. And so there's no reason not to do that with network or with devices or things that are physical in nature. Absolutely. So it's basically just an extension. So it's a model that they're familiar with. And that Absolutely. might help. Yeah. Yeah. It might help you as well in terms of reaching out. To, right. to... Okay. Well, um, Marie, thank you so much. And I think we can move to the Q&A. And I'm just seeing them now. And uh, uh, let me start with the question for Jim. Um, and the question that we have is, uh, uh, what's the biggest challenge for high-speed uh, data? So uh, in terms of backhaul and in terms of, you know, the fact that you're dealing with big moving objects made of metal, I guess. Well, our biggest challenge is we're exposed to so many people with so many devices. Um, The train can hold about 360 people. And even if we have 150 of those connected on the network, that is that many people demanding at every instant uh, that they're surfing or what have you they're demanding um, some data via one of those or several of those eight modems that we have. So um, the sheer problem is that we've got so many people, it'd be like inviting the whole train over to your house to use your Wi-Fi network. It's not going to go well um, if you have everybody streaming things. So that's, that's the real big challenge we have. Um, It's kind of like a cap that we have and that's going to gradually 
hopefully with 5G get lifted a little bit more, um, there'll be a different set of things that we can accomplish. Um, you know, if video can be compressed even more, that gets better, but uh, it's, it's all kind of an evolution of things. And um, we kind of offer, I, I call it the reading internet, is what we can offer. You can do your email, you can read the New York Times or what have you, but you can't watch YouTube or watch a Netflix movie at this point in time. That's our cap. Yeah, yeah. Um, and any new specific, specific new technologies that you're looking at right now? No, there's not much we can do to change our particular route. Um, mm -hmm. What is happening along routes where people have ownership of the right of way, and this is happening in the Northeast corridor, they're building out their own network. So they're going to have a much, much higher uh, backhaul opportunity uh, via Wi Fi, unlicensed spectrum, but really there's nobody, very few people competing for that spectrum. So they're getting tremendous throughput. Um, they're testing with different radios. And so that it's just a matter of kind of do you own your destiny and do you build your own network and does that pencil out? And in a frequently used corridor like the Northeast Corridor, it does. Certainly over in Europe, it would pencil out even more because of the density of use. Um, so that's kind of the proposition there. In our case, we don't control the, our destiny like that. So we're going to be beholden really to the improvements available in the mobile operator world. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, I have a few questions here for Marin. So the first one is, <clears throat> if mobile connectivity becomes so business critical, to what extent are MNOs willing to provide service uh, um, levels and KPIs to enterprise markets? That's a really, really good question. So today we do that for um, our IP uh, wireline mobile network. We have SLAs. We actually sell SLAs. It's one of our value propositions. I think as uh, networks get more robust as networks integrate and converge beyond where they are today. I, I can see us doing it in the very near future and, and offering very similar um, SLAs um, around the performance of our wireless network as well. Do you think that uh, um, 5G will help you in that respect? Uh, absolutely. And I think for us in particular, as um, Jim just mentioned, as we go and densify the network, I think we have capabilities with um, many, many different options that have been deployed in Japan with SoftBank when it comes to uh, microcells and, and all sorts of different boosters. And, and really, um, for one reason, one, you need to have densification to really bring 5G to life. And two, that is all useless if you don't have spectrum. And the one thing that we do have um, here at Sprint is we have more spectrum than anybody else combined. And I think um, that will really allow us to have um, really great coverage, uh, really good capacity speed and latency that are all really, really important uh, for 5G. And then once you have that, I think you can start to talk about SLAs and really differentiate on that front. Okay, another question so for you, it's um, about the individual vertical markets and uh, their uh, respective um, privacy requirements. So if you th think about especially things like healthcare, finance, uh, um, how can you address them specifically? As opposed um, to, I guess, other, other, you know, other verticals. Sure. Is the question more from a, uh, from a mobile perspective, from a yeah. wireless perspective? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, so today there are a lot of different providers uh, that are in our network uh, that really allow us to have um, compliance that is required in certain verticals, like financial or healthcare, uh, that, that are built physically into our network. Uh, and, and really provide that level of security and um, our ability to meet the SLAs or the compliance uh, from our clients. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, I see another question here about, still for you, and uh, sorry about, but I, I want to make, make sure since uh, the, the, the operators always get uh, a lot of questions. Um, so what are options does Sprint offer now in the future for signal sources for the enterprise-owned uh, in business wireless services systems. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. I apologize. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, so what, what what options do you have either today or in the future for signal sources for enterprise-owned uh, uh, in-building wireless systems? Uh, so so I think we have plenty of options today. Mm -hmm. I think where options become exponentially larger, uh, and we're actually deploying microcells um, really with our clients today. Uh, where we can, where it makes sense. And so um, 
th those opportunities exist today as we started to really densify our network and deploy uh, a whole host of new tools, uh, whether that be a magic box, uh, several different versions of micro cells that can be really uh, deployed anywhere and on really short notice and make a really, really meaningful improvement in the experience of the network uh, for the end users within you know, a building or, or a factory or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So this is available today. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, so so this is exciting. And there's another question here, and uh, maybe I'll get Jim to comment on that, is on, on the relative role of Wi-Fi and cellular. So you mentioned the fact that you might have, you know, might be interesting to have cellular, I mean, in in, uh, in car, in within train, cellular, small cells, but also Wi-Fi. H how do you see the two of them together? So, uh, and, and in fact, what, what do you see? Because, you know, people on the train, they, they have Wi-Fi, but they can still get connected to cellular. What, what's the relationship there? Well, I, I think there's kind of two things. Um, any one particular cell provider may not be good along the entire route. So if you're, you're with that provider, you may have a gap where the voice performance is poor. Um, the Wi-Fi is more a, like a constant low level, and with uh, availability, it's also gets you outside of the Faraday cage that's on the train. So the Wi-Fi is kind of the unifier uh, of all providers and also keeps dipping into their data plan. The small cell opportunity is really underexplored in terms of on, on the train or on a transit vehicle. And that's not something that we really have experience with yet. It's just sort of sitting out there and it would be a matter of, is it worth improving the voice experience or the data experience if you don't want to go through the on-train wireless network there could be security reasons or there's also vpn reasons that some of the vpns don't work that well over our network so what we see is about if we presumed everybody has a connection on the train uh of this 360 people let's say we had that usually about half are on the wi-fi network half are on you know get working outside the window trying to get out to talk to that cell tower and then getting the handoff, which can be a little awkward for the performance, as far as I know, of the, of the mobile networks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, Mary, what, what do you think about the, the coexistence with Wi-Fi and, uh, and cellular? Yeah, I would agree with Jim. I mean, I think they coexist today and they, they will coexist in the future. I, I view, um, you know, that really being driven by the best possible customer experience. And so most of our devices today are really designed to give that optimal connectivity and experience to a customer. And so, you know, no carrier is going to be perfect every single time in every single instance. And so that becomes almost your safety net. Uh, I also think there is a change in behavior from a consumer as we are moving away from you know, buckets of data, uh, which a lot of our competitors were, you know, pushing up until just a few months ago into a world of unlimited where you're not going to be confined by at least what you're paying or what you're getting in a bucket of data. And, and we're all essentially unlimited. I think that will also get people as networks get better to shift more from Wi-Fi to uh, a cellular connectivity. Uh, I think we've just conditioned the industry has over time conditioned people to go for Wi-Fi uh, to preserve their, their data. Um, and their and their you know payments to the mobile carriers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that that's interesting because at some point you might have a situation where you want to offload onto cellular rather than offload onto Wi-Fi. I yep. mean, I, I mean, it, it, can, it can go both ways because sure. you just uh, you just use whatever whatever it's available and whatever it's in need. But it gives you the best experience yeah. at the time. Exactly. Yep. And this is really what you care about is how to make sure you get the best experience for the subscriber, for the enterprise or for whatever IoT service is, right? So it's not what's best, it's, uh, you know, what's available and what's, what works in that environment. Yep. And I think also the other thing I would add on, and, and you will see more of this, certainly from us, but from our competitors as well, from a mobile um, uh, perspective um, with individuals, within, within those plans, I think there will be other value added services that I think will push people even more to be using their network and their device because you wouldn't be able to get access to those things on a Wi-Fi network. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, I tried to give uh, more room to, to our guests, but there is a question that I would like to address in the final minute because I realized that I didn't go into, and it's about uh, atomic networks. And what do I mean by that? Um, 
so what I mean by an atomic network, which is what we currently have, it's a network where you have different uh, 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 independent units like cells. So you have a macro cell, a set of, it's usually in the network is a set of macro cells and they all work on their own. And uh, uh, that model, I think it's, it's coming to an end as you move to a uh, virtualized Iran, you start seeing models where uh, you have multiple multiple layers and those multiple layers interact with each other so they uh, you know the, the coordinate transmission and eventually you we start seeing solutions where you do not have cells per se as, a, as an insular elements but they have you have multiple antennas connected to basically the, the same the same unit so you don't have handoffs and so what that means is you get to a network that it's pervasive but it's 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 not made of uh, units it's it's more you know ubiquitous and i think that's all uh so thank you all so much for listening in and uh, thank you jim and marin for uh, uh participating to the webinar today thanks a lot